Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. All of you, especially those who are visiting us today, thanks for coming. We pray God will bless your worship with us. We've entered into a new season of the church year. This last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and so we are now in the season of Lent. That 40-day, not counting the six Sundays, 40-day journey we make every year to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a solemn and a penitential season of the church year, but it's not one that, that should leave us without hope, but just the opposite, a, a season that gives us hope. During the Sundays of Lent, our focus of worship, our theme will be crushed. We remember that our Savior was crushed for our sins, but we also remember that his death and ultimately his resurrection that we will celebrate on Easter Sunday means that our old enemy, Satan, has been crushed, just as God had promised in the Garden of Eden that the offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head. This morning, our theme will be that our temptations are crushed by Christ's perfect obedience. We begin the Lenten season by remembering Jesus' temptation during the 40 days that he fasted in the wilderness and how he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan in our behalf and defeated him with his perfect obedience. And by God's grace, through faith in him, we are credited with Christ's perfect obedience. May God bless our worship this day. Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our consideration as we begin this Lenten season is taken from our second reading this morning from Hebrews chapter 4. The writer says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our champion, our hero, who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with our enemy and crushed him for us, dear friends. Like a, a pin popping a balloon, there is a certain phrase that when it is said can completely take all of the wind out of us. That phrase goes like this. Been there, done that. When we're telling somebody about something we think is just amazing that, that we did or happened to us, something that we feel maybe nobody else has ever done or they've never experienced something like that, and then they say that. Been there, done that. <sighs> And, and, and that story that we were telling that we thought was going to wow everybody suddenly is no big deal because they've been there and done that too. Well, Jesus could certainly say, been there, done that to virtually every experience we have. There is no pain we could ever feel no challenge we could ever face, no temptation that would ever come our way that Jesus also didn't experience during his time on earth. Been there, done that. But that phrase isn't always meant to, to be a put down. Sometimes people will say that to us in order to show that they've gone through that too. They have empathy for us. They do it to build us up, not take us down. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews is pointing out for us this morning when he reminds us that Jesus has been there and done that. As we begin this Lenten season, let's dive a little deeper into what the writer to the Hebrews is telling us this morning. This, this phrase, been there, done that. 
not that we might be taken down a peg or two, but just the opposite, that we might be built up, that we might be strengthened, that we might be comforted knowing that Jesus truly has been there and done that for us. But before we, we look at what Jesus did, let's look at where he came from. Jesus is God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit from all eternity. That means all glory is his. He possesses all knowledge. There's nothing in the universe that is, exists that wasn't created by him. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. But a little over 2,000 years ago, he left it. He set aside that glory that was his as God. He emptied himself of that perfect knowledge that he has. And he took on human flesh and blood and he became one of us. He traded his throne of glory for a feeding trough. He grew up in a poor family, learning the family trade of carpentry. He experienced hardship and difficulty and temptation, as we heard this morning. Everything we would ever experience or could ever experience, he did. He's been there. He's done that. So think about what that means. Do you feel pain? Do you know what it's like to, to, to hurt? Maybe from an injury or illness? So does Jesus. He's been there. He's done that. In fact, we can't even conceive of the agony that he faced with the whip and the beating and the thorns and the nails. Have you ever had somebody let you down? A friend who betrayed you? Family members who've turned their back on you? Do you know that pain and that loneliness? Jesus has been there and done that too. His own brothers, his half-brothers, at one point during his public ministry, said he was out of his mind for claiming to be the Messiah and the Son of God. The residents of his hometown, the, the members of the synagogue he went to in Nazareth, totally rejected him, even tried to throw him off a cliff and kill him. One of his very own of the twelve apostles literally betrayed him. Yeah, Jesus has been there and done that too. Have you ever experienced sadness because somebody you love has been taken from you in death? Have you ever wept at the grave of a friend? Jesus has been there and done that too. In, in the shortest verse of the Bible, which also happens to be perhaps one of the more poignant verses of the Bible, we read that Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Do you face temptations? Do you struggle with sin, with, with that voice in your head that comes sometimes from our own sinful nature, sometimes from peer pressure, sometimes, ultimately, always from the devil himself? Jesus has been there and done that too. Tempted in every way, just as we are. So what does that tell you about Jesus? It tells you he can relate to us. He knows what it's like. Or perhaps even more important, that means we can relate to him even though he is God from all eternity. Because he's been there. And he's done that. Everything. But Jesus didn't just come down from heaven, become a man, experience all of these hardships and pain and sorrow and temptations just so that he could find out what it's like. Well, why not? Because number one, he's God and he knows everything. He didn't have to like come down to this earth to, to, to find out something. He, he already knows. No, there, there was a, a, a much more important reason than simply for Jesus to experience what we do so that he could relate to us. 
He did it as our substitute in our behalf. You know, like, like David, King David, as we heard in our familiar words of the Old Testament reading this morning, like David, the champion, faced the champion of the Philistines toe-to-toe and defeated him. That's what Jesus did. During the Lenten season, we, we, we normally focus especially on his suffering and death on the cross, and rightly so. But as we begin the Lenten season, the first Sunday of Lent, we are reminded that Jesus didn't just die for us, he lived for us. He didn't just defeat our enemy, the devil, by shedding his blood, he did it by his perfect obedience. For every time that Satan threw a temptation at Jesus, he resisted perfectly. And here's the most amazing and the best part. Through faith in him, you get the credit. By God's grace and through this God-given gift of faith, our crummy track record when it comes to obedience to God and keeping his commandments is erased completely and replaced with the perfect record of obedience by God's Son, Jesus Christ. We are credited with Christ's perfection for every time we have given in, listened to that voice, caved into peer pressure, done what we know is wrong, or failed to do what we know we should be doing, Jesus did it perfectly. He has been there and he has done that and he did it for you and for me. The victory is ours. But that also should do something else for us. It gives us an example. No, we will never, ever, ever come close to the perfection of Jesus Christ in his perfect obedience and his perfect ability to resist Satan's temptations. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't and can't try. It's so easy for us when, when we face a temptation. Maybe it's a pet sin that we, we find ourselves slipping into all the time. And maybe we find ourselves... Not really trying, not, not really resisting, because, well, why should we? Here's why we should. Not so that we can be saved, we already are saved. But because we're saved, because Jesus did it for us, we want to show our love and gratitude for him. How? By following in his footsteps. Look at how Jesus fought against Satan's temptations in the wilderness. He didn't use his almighty power as God. He used the powerful word of God, the same weapon we have. And every single time he was tempted by Satan, he met it with that word of God, and Satan finally fled. Jesus has been there. Jesus has done that. He did it for us. We follow in his footsteps and do it for him too. But in our lesson this morning, the writer to the Hebrews doesn't just point us back to what Jesus did. He also points us now to what he does. That's why he starts out by saying, we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. So what is it that Jesus continues to do? Well, I think to, to understand and appreciate more what he's speaking of in our lesson this morning, we should know a little bit more about what the priests did, especially the high priest in Old Testament times. We, we probably think first and foremost of the sacrifices that the priests would offer in the temple. And certainly Jesus, our great high priest, did that. That's, again, what we typically focus on, especially during Lent, the sacrifice he made of his own body, his own blood that he shed for us willingly on the cross. But that's not all the priests did. The priests also represented the people by praying for them, interceding for them. When, when the people sinned against God, it would be the, the high priest who would go to God's throne of mercy and plead for their forgiveness. 
when the nation was facing a famine or a drought. Once again, the, the high priest would go on behalf of the nation and beg God for his mercy and relief. When they're facing the threat of an enemy, the high priest would pray on behalf of that nation for victory and peace. And that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus our Lord does now. He intercedes for us. Think about that. The the same Jesus who went through everything we do, all of the pain, all of the problems, all of the temptations, he's the same one that now in heaven takes our problems and pains and and temptations before the throne of his heavenly Father. When we sin, it is Jesus who pleads for our forgiveness on the basis of his perfect sacrifice. When we're hurting and facing sorrow, it is Jesus who goes on our behalf, intercedes for us, the one who experienced those same sorrows and pains that we do and now pleads for our relief. When we face temptation, it is Jesus who also faced every kind of temptation we do who intercedes in our behalf at the throne of God. It's no wonder that the writer to the Hebrews says at the end of our lesson, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Boy, I'll tell you, if, if knowing that Jesus, our Savior, experienced everything we go through, can relate to every problem and pain and challenge that we face and, and guarantees that our prayers are heard and answered. If that doesn't lead us to pray confidently and constantly, I don't know what will. Been there, done that. Jesus has absolutely been there and done that in every respect. That doesn't put us down. It does the opposite. It builds us up. Jesus, our Savior, became one of us. He's been there facing our old evil foe. He's done that, winning the victory by his perfect life in the wilderness, at the cross. Been there, done that, so that we might be there with him forever. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.